Yesterday morning, I drove a driving, driving rain to Hagerstown to visit our brother uh, Jeffrey McKinney, Jr., in the prison there. And last time I was there, I think I mentioned to you that they let me in with a Bible. You got to go through checkpoint and then they put a wristband on you and they also stamp your hand. You got to show that where you leave the check-in place, then you go to where the men are, the, the visiting place, you got to show your wristband, put your hand under the light. So last time I was there, during the visit, they took my Bible away. And then at the end of the visit, the guard said to me, we didn't recognize you were clergy, I didn't have a uniform on, see? I wore my uniform yesterday. Uh, and uh, next time you come, you can bring your Bible. So they gave me my Bible back, and I went on my way. So yesterday I got there, and... Uh, Going through the check-in, he sort of just like the airport, you got to take your shoes off and belt off. And this lady, correctional officer, says, you can't bring a Bible in here. <laughs> I said, well, let me tell you, last time I was here, I brought it in. They said you took it away from me. Then they said, next time you come, you can bring it. So she got on the phone and uh, called over there, next building, let me go through with my Bible. So she looks through it, and I thought maybe she might uh, confiscate my sermon notes from last Sunday, but she didn't. And... Uh, let me go. So I had a good visit with Jeff and he's doing very well. And, and, and for an hour, we talk theology. That's what we do. We talk theology. He doesn't have anybody to talk theology with really uh, in there like he wants to. He's hungry uh, for the word of God and growing. And he would really love to uh, have our worship services. Uh, all the men in prison now have their own, their own computer, their own laptop, their own tablet. Whether you agree with that or not, it uh, helps them uh, uh, pass time. Obviously, they can't get on the Internet, uh, but they can listen to music and various things. And so I think it's, it's a good thing. And uh, if we were able to put our worship on a, uh, like a, uh, some type of a podcast, he could listen to it. Man, we'll have to see about that. He'd really, really like that. So he brings his greetings to you all, covets our prayers uh, uh, very much. We're ending, last week, we ended a 12-part series on prayer. And hopefully, we learned a lot from that. And now this week, we are thinking about the Easter season. And uh, I've given the title to this message, Divine Daytime Darkness. I mentioned this last year, this day, I mentioned it again, late Preacher Ed Bowsman said he preached a sermon on the crucifixion of Jesus, and he said, I, I was convinced that people would be convicted by that. He said, on the way out of church, people said, enjoyed it, enjoyed it, enjoyed it, enjoyed it. He said, how can you enjoy a sermon on the crucifixion of Jesus? Well, Something to think about. Uh, let's uh, bow for prayer as we uh, develop this most important subject. Oh, Father in heaven, I remember that old song. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story of Jesus, sweetest as ever was heard. So, Lord, today... As we develop this serious and sobering message that the world hates, may the old, old story be like new to us. May we hear it afresh. May we stand in awe of you and leave here wondering. That Jesus did that for me. Jesus did that for me. So, Father, to this end today, we pray for your blessing in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Springtime is a time of year when we mark 
various events, as is every season. Springtime, the trees begin to bud and blossom, and they come alive from their winter dormancy. Maybe if you're like me, your allergies come alive also. Thousands flock to Washington to see the cherry blossoms. I even saw yesterday that the Washington Nationals had cherry blossoms on their jersey yesterday. <laughs> the sports world, March Madness, bridges wintertime with spring. And tomorrow night, Connecticut and San Diego State will play for the national championship. Baseball is another sign of spring. When baseball starts, you know spring has sprung. And I like to pull up John Fogarty's song, Center Field. What a great song. Put me in, coach. Love that song. Something about uh, baseball and spring that ignites your passion if you like that sport. Spring itself is determined by the vernal or the spring equinox. You say, what in the world is that? Well, we're going to get a little science lesson here today. The word equinox means equal night. Pull up the next slide, if you would, Caleb. Can you see that all right? Okay, that's good. The earth, here, 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 and here, moves in two directions. It rotates this way, as we have an example up here. It rotates that way, a complete revolution every 24 hours. At its widest point, the earth is about 25,000 miles around circumference. That means we're going about 1,000 miles an hour this way. My hair's not even messing up. Is that, is that amazing to you? Every 24 hours. But we're also making a revolution this way in an, in an, elliptical, an elliptical pattern around the sun. Niall said to me this morning that the sun moved. I said to her, the sun didn't go anywhere. Well, let's, let's start here with where we are <clears throat> a couple weeks ago. When you get to springtime, the sun hits the earth about the center of the equator here. And therefore, around the 20th of March, you have equal sunlight and equal darkness. I guess that's why this side is dark and this is light. 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness in both hemispheres, in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. You have that in March around the 20th and in September around the 23rd as the sun hits the earth in the central part of its uh, circumference here. However, as we continue to make this, this revolution around the sun, how often? And about six hours. 365 days and about six hours. Because every four years we get a day called leap day in leap year every four years on the presidential election years. We'll be next year. Anybody born on February 29th here? I know a guy that was. So as we, as we leave March and we head towards June, the daylight hours are getting longer. And I personally like that. I don't know about you, but I like that. The daylight's getting, getting more daylight for us, especially with the time change, which has nothing to do with this. When you get over here to the summer solstice, by the way, this is the earth's axis, but there's not really a rod sticking through the earth. That's just put there for emphasis. Okay, this is the what pole? 
That's good. When you get over here to the summer solstice, we who are up here in the north have more daylight hours, less dark hours. Doesn't get dark around here till like 8.45, close to 9 o'clock. Go, go west of here, it's 10 o'clock. On the same time zone, you, you Indiana folks that are watching, it didn't get dark your house till 10 o'clock. However, in the Southern Hemisphere, down here in South America, they, they have their darker time and their winter. Why? Because their pole is facing away from the sun. We're facing the sun in the Northern Hemisphere. They're facing away from the sun. They have winter. We have summer. Then, after June 20th, the days start getting shorter. And I don't care for that. Until you get over here to September, and you have as much daylight as you have dark, about 12 hours in both, both hemispheres, because, once again, the sun has crossed the earth in the central point. There's equal amount of sunlight on both, and then as you go this direction, we up here, we're starting to face away, away from the sun, and our days keep getting shorter until around here in December, it gets dark at 5 o'clock. Go to Delaware, it gets darker earlier than that. But these folks down here in the South America, their poles pointing toward the sun, and guess what season they have? Summer. We've got winter, they've got summer. Now, anybody here been to Alaska? Some of you all went to Alaska last year. I looked on this globe. By the way, the earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees. We know that. The earth does not, the earth does not rotate on its axis. It always remains at 23 and a half degrees, just like that does not rotate, goes around the sun just like that in elliptic, elliptical form. I looked on this globe. Alaska up here is only like 1,200 and some miles barrow, the northernmost point on the Beaufort Sea, the Arctic, Arctic Ocean is only 1,200 miles from the North Pole. Did you know this? That barrow, Alaska has no sun for 67 days. They have no sun for 67 days because they're over here at the top of the world and their North Pole's facing away from the sun. They also have 80 days where there's no night when they're over here. They have 80 days where it never gets dark because they're on top of the world. Now, let me ask you a question. How in the world... Could you understand that and you know it's true? The evidence proves it's true. How could you look at that and not believe there's a God? The earth is never out of balance, always rotating once every 24 hours and making a revolution every 365 days and six hours. Psalms 74, 16 and 17 says, Your, roll the PowerPoint, please. You want to put your phone down back there and watch what you're doing. Yours is the day. Yours also is the night. You prepared the light and the sun. You've established all the boundaries of the earth. You made the summer and the winter. That's what the Bible says. You, you made the day and the night. You established the summer and the winter. That's how, that's how the seasons are determined by how the sun, the earth rotates around the sun and the various Heat reflection creates the season. John 5, 17 says, but he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself am working. Who do you think's keeping all this going? Who do you think's firing the sun is not BG and E? Yeah, God is doing all that. Spring's also the season when we celebrate Easter. Easter is not always the same Sunday, is it? Its date is determined by the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring 
the vernal equinox. Thus, Easter can be as early as, as March 22nd. Did you know that? By the way, in the year, 2000, the year 2285, Easter will be on March 22nd. Anybody plan to be around then? 2285 will be March 22nd. It can be as late as April the 25th which it was in 1943. And in 2011, Easter was on April 24th. Only one, like one Sunday between Easter and Mother's Day. As we think about this Palm Sunday and what we call the week of passion, much of the emphasis in churches is on the physical suffering of Christ. And we need to emphasize that about, about what Jesus went, to, went through. His suffering was terrible. I want to ask you a question. Was Jesus' physical suffering any worse than the thieves that hung on each side of him? No. Jesus' physical suffering was no worse than what they went through. But we also emphasize this time of year, the, not only the physical suffering of Jesus, if you saw the passion of the Christ, I saw it once, I don't ever plan to see it again. But also the, the love, this is, this is love for God, so love the world, right? John 15, 13 says, greater love is no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Who said that? Jesus did on the uh, Thursday before he, he, he put it in action. Yeah. So we emphasize at this time of year the, the physical suffering of Jesus and the love of God and the love of Christ. Every Christian understands that Christ died for our sins. I did a search in my internet browser last week, just scriptures that talk about the death of Christ. A, a hundred came up just like that. I'll just give you one. First John chapter five, verse three. First John chapter three, verse five. <laughs> you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. That's just one of multiple scriptures. Why did Jesus appear? Be a good teacher? Take away sin. That's why he appeared. I want to approach this subject this morning from three different perspectives and basically three different times on the clock. And our main emphasis today is going to be on what God did here, but that won't be till we get to the second point. Our, our first point today is, let's talk about early morning, nine o'clock or mid-morning, 9 a.m., mid-morning. Jesus, say Jesus, the most precious name you ever heard in your life. Jesus was put on the cross willingly. Nine o'clock. Mark 15, 25 says it was the third hour when they assassinated him, when they crucified him. It was the third hour of the day, but I want to share with you another scripture. John chapter 19, 14 says, now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. What day is that? That's Friday. Passover begins at sundown Friday. It was the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold your king. Wait a minute. Jesus is put on the cross at the, at the third hour. This says the sixth hour. Who, who's talking in that verse? Anybody know? Pilate. Pilate says at the sixth hour, was Pilate at the cross? No. Here's what you got to understand. The Jews counted time from sunup to sundown. When, when, did, it, when did the uh, Sabbath begin? Sundown. That's right. So the first hour of the day is six o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning. That makes the third hour of the day what? Nine o'clock. That's right, brother. But John is counting by Roman time, which is, guess who counts by Roman time? We do. What's the sixth hour of the day? Six o'clock in the morning. That's exactly right. At 6 a.m. on Good Friday, Pilate has washed his hands of Jesus and said, here's your king. John's counting by Roman time. He, was, he wrote his book after uh, Jerusalem fell in AD 70. John writes much later. Mark is earlier. Mark's counting by Jewish time. That's how you get these. That's how you harmonize these 
ours. God's word is truth. It will harmonize itself. For the first three hours of Jesus' assassination, his crucifixion, the narrative was the people that were around the cross. That, that's what, where the storyline is. It's, it's the people that were there. And we reviewed this. We went over this last year. So this is a bit of review, but it's been a year, so we're okay. First, there's the rulers of the Jews. Who are they? They are the, the Pharisees and Sadducees who were sad, you see. Luke 23, 35 says, and the people stood by looking on. Looking on at what? That's right. Even the rulers were sneering at him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, the chosen one, let him save himself. They, they never talked directly to Jesus. They just talked about him. Well, they never addressed him. They just ran their mouth about him. Take a look at this quote. Foster says, when a person dies, usually people refrain from criticism and leave judgment in God's hands. That's typically true. Unable to bring any real charges against Jesus. That's true too. They substitute it simply with venom. If he's who he says he is, they'll come down. They, they totally missed it, didn't they? Like a lot of people, they totally miss it. They don't want to accept what the Bible really says because they don't want to think that their loved ones didn't go to heaven. Well, there's the rulers of the Jews sneering at Jesus. Then there, there's the crowd, Mark 15, 29. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the temple, rebuild it in three days? Guess you're not going to do that now, are you? <laughs> earlier, about 45 minutes ago, I read where Jesus came to Jerusalem riding on a, on a donkey that had never been sat on before. And the people shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On Sunday, they shouted, hail Jesus. On Friday, they shouted, nail Jesus. People are fickle, aren't they? People are fickle. Yeah. That's what they did. There's the crowd saying, ha, wagging their heads, uh, totally ignorant of what's going on. Then there's the thieves. Ever wonder why Jesus was placed between two thieves? There's a reason for that. Birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, they wanted it to look like Jesus is one of those scoundrels. The thieves join in, they join in in the mocking of Jesus also. They mocked him. They felt like they were dying before their time and, and Jesus was to blame. And so they both mock Luke 23, 39. They say, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Save yourself and us. Yeah, if you're who you say you are, if, if it, Jesus, if there was ever a time to prove it, now's the time. Get us out of here. Stage left. However, one thief had a change of heart. All these people around there, and most of them don't have a foggy clue what's going on. And yet this one thief comes under conviction about his sin and he says to the other guy, 10 or 12 feet away, talking to him, his partner in crime, and guess who's listening in the middle? Yeah, that's right. Roll the PowerPoint. The one thief said, do you not fear God since you're under the same condemnation? We are indeed suffering justly. We're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. <laughs> But this man has done nothing wrong. What changed that man's heart? Maybe the way Jesus handled the crowd, maybe what he said, forgiving them. But this man had a change of heart and Jesus extended him forgiveness and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. As far as we know, Jesus only made three statements 
in those first three hours. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And to John, behold, your mother has Jesus commended the care of his mother into the hands of his most beloved disciple, John. Well, let's hurry on now to what we really want to get to. Not that, that wasn't what we want to get to either. But secondly, let's go to noon or midday, 12 o'clock, high noon. At noon, springtime, probably a bright sunny day. The sun is where around that time? High in the sky, right? High in the sky. Everything's been normal so far. And then God took over this drama and said, this is enough. God took over. And here's what Matthew 27, 45 and 46 says. Now from the sixth hour, that's, by the way, I put that in there in brackets. That's my insertion. That's noon. Darkness fell upon the entire land, all the land until the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock. Let me ask you a question. How in the world did God do that? The answer is, we don't know. But I am confident of this. If God can cause that thing to spin around perfectly every day, 24 hours a day without adjustment, he can probably darken the sun for three hours. Don't you think so? Uh, some people have said in history, it was an eclipse. Let's think about that. An eclipse exactly at noon covers the whole sun for three hours. There's a a a complete eclipse for three hours. You know what people are? They're stupid. People are just stupid. They're just dumb. Other people have said the devil's responsible for that. The devil is the king of immorality. He's the prince of power of the air, but the devil is not in charge of the natural world. And this darkness is a natural event with no natural explanation because it has only a supernatural explanation. That's all it has, man. There is no natural explanation. This is a supernatural event, which we call a what? A miracle. A miracle is that which could not happen unless God did it. Let's get to the meat of this. Did you know that darkness is associated with divine judgment? Darkness is associated with God's judgment. Exodus 10, 21, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky. There may be darkness over the land, even a darkness which may be felt. That was the ninth, com- the, not the ninth commandment, the ninth plague. It was so dark the people could feel it. What was that? God's judgment. Darkness. Exodus 19, 16 to 18, a year ago, we had 11 sermons on 10 commandments. Came down on the third day when it was morning, there was thunder and fly- lightning flashes and a, notice this, a thick cloud. There's your idea, darkness on the mountain. Very loud trumpet sound. The people were in the camp, trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood at the foot of the mountain. Yes, three or four million people there. God showed up. The people was trembled. Joel 2.31, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Notice that. What does it say? When God will bring judgment, the sun will what? Darkness is connected with what word? Judgment. Amos, one more. Amos 8, 9. It will come about in the day, it declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark. Notice that. In broad daylight. 
Amos chapter 8, verse 9, that's exactly what it says. The sun will go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Now, let me ask you a question. If darkness in the Bible is associated with God's judgment, who in the world was God bringing judgment on that day? That's right. Say it again. The answer is Jesus. Back in the back also. This is God's judgment. The darkness is not the absence of God. It is the presence of God. It is the presence of God in judgment, fury, infinite wrath moved by infinite righteousness, released in infinite punishment on the infinite son who absorbed eternal hell for three hours. It is here he is crushed for our iniquities and made a curse for us. This darkness is God's judgment upon his own son. Take a look at these four scriptures. Three of them come from that chapter we call the fifth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah 53. <laughs> it's just like Isaiah's taking notes. Smitten of God and afflicted. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. There is no chapter in all the Bible quoted more in the New Testament than that one, seven or eight times. He did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Let me ask you a question. Based upon that, who crucified Jesus? The answer is God did. Wasn't our plan? We didn't have the plan. We didn't have the man. God crucified Jesus. The darkness is God's judgment upon his son. Now let's wade into some deep water. And let's take on this statement. If Christ actually took our place in bearing the wrath of God for uh, the wrath of God, this means that he bore the full force of God's wrath. He suffered the equivalent of eternity in hell for every sinner. We must keep in mind that both the physical and spiritual suffering of Christ was experienced by the one who was by nature divine and thus infinite in his being. Thus, even though he suffered for only a finite period of time, the suffering was infinite. It cannot be quantified. This helps us answer two questions. First, how can the suffering of Christ, which lasted only for a few hours, be the equivalent of eternity in hell for the whole human race? Because he was God. The finite suffering of the infinite being would seem to be equivalent to infinite suffering of finite beings. That's a lot in that. You see, at this time of year, what's mostly talked about is what Jesus went through physically. And as terrible as it was, the thieves went through that also. That wasn't Jesus' greatest suffering. But also what we need to emphasize is what Jesus suffered in his own soul. We'll talk about that a little bit in some in the next point quickly. Jesus being separated from his father. But Jesus' greatest suffering was his divine suffering. When Jesus was on the cross, in a short time, he suffered in his divine nature, which has no beginning and has no end. That's where Jesus paid the price. Therefore, when God looks upon us, he looks upon us as if we've been to hell for all eternity because Jesus paid that price in his divine nature, which has no beginning and has no end. That's what that means. Jesus paid that price in his divine nature, which has no beginning and no end. Hell is called the outer darkness, the black darkness. God brought hell to Jesus that day. He unleashed his wrath upon him in the fury of darkness. You see, all people that go to hell are there forever. You know why? Because they have to pay for their sins infinitely. Sins committed in a finite time against an infinite God must be, must be suffered for infinitely. 
But the reverse of that is this. Jesus, who's an infinite God, suffered in a finite time. He suffered on the cross. He paid the price in his divine nature. And that's where the price was paid in his divinity is where he suffered infinitely. So when God looks at you, he sees that you've been to hell for all eternity because Jesus already went there on the cross. No wonder Newton called grace amazing. Quickly, number three, let's go to three o'clock or afternoon. After three hours of darkness and silence, Jesus spoke. Matthew 27, 46, about the ninth hour. That means what? Five minutes of three? About the ninth hour? Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you know this is the only time that Jesus ever prayed and he didn't use the term father, he used God. Had Jesus lost faith in God? No. No, Jesus is looking for affection from his father. Remember, Jesus would say something twice for emphasis and affection. Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, or Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jesus is looking for affection from his father, but there is no affection in hell. There's no comfort in that place of darkness. It's now three o'clock and the Sabbath is going to start. When's the Sabbath going to start? Sundown. So when the Sabbath starts, we don't do any what? We don't do any work. So it's, a, it's, it's been dark for three hours. We got Passover lambs that got to be slaughtered. Darkness is going to be here. We got to slaughter the Passover lambs. Passover starting. And so as a, these thousands and thousands and thousands of lambs are being slaughtered, this is what happens. Luke 23, 45. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. Matthew 27, 51 says it like this. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks Split. What does that mean? Well, here's what that means. In the temple where the Jews sacrificed animals, the altar of burnt offering, there was a very thick curtain, maybe a couple inches thick, separating what's called the holy place from the holy of holies. It's a, it was a perfect cube, 30 feet wide, 30 feet long, and 30 feet high. 20 cubits, 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. Inside that location was the Ark of the Covenant, box about as long as that table, overlaid with gold. And one day a year, very briefly, the high priest went in there and he sprinkled the blood of, a, of, an, of an innocent animal on the, on the lid of that, of that Ark of the Covenant. Had a rope tied around his leg. Tradition says if he died in there, God pulled him out because nobody else welcomed him in there. When they're getting ready to sacrifice the Passover lambs, God rips that curtain in two, signifying... The sacrifices are over. The priesthood is over. The blood of bulls and goats is over. And there's now a new way to him. Those were just shadows of the substance that belongs to Christ. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says it like this. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, who does? We have confidence... By what? The blood of bulls and goats? No. By the blood of Jesus, a new living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Notice that, the veil. We have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that 22nd verse is a reference to baptism. Your body is washed in the water and your conscience is cleansed by not the water, by the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm about finished. Then Luke 23, 46 says, 
Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, Jesus is back to saying what? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. I've seen several people die in my life and most of those people didn't have a loud voice within them. They had a very soft voice because they're weak. Their life is about to leave them. Some of them have no voice at all. And yet Jesus says in a what? Remember when Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. Guess what Jesus is doing at three o'clock? He's laying his life down. He's laying his life down. Willingly. Lastly, he quoted Psalms 31.5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. That was evening prayer the Jews prayed. They prayed that in the evening. Psalms 31, 5. But what, what, did you, what did Jesus add to that scripture? Back up to the previous slide. What's the word Jesus added to it? And, 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 huh? That's right, Gail. He added the word father to it. Now go back to that slide. Why didn't Jesus also say, you have ransomed me, O God, O Lord, God of truth? Now, he's not the one who was, needed to be ransomed. He's the one that paid the ransom price. He left that part out, didn't he? Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. He was the redeemer, the one that set us free, not the one who was redeemed. And so fellowship at three o'clock, fellowship with the Father had been restored. And Jesus died. And he went to paradise. 